Can you go back to the summary? As, as I understand, the basic thing in the architecture is drives. Drives and needs. This is where everything starts. Yeah. I know I, you start I, thinking there from there. two aspects. Drives and needs, and then the fact that we need to reduce complexity. So part of our drive is to not make decisions and to minimize the amount of decision making that's going on. Can you imagine something the architecture which is not based on drives and needs. We should, sometimes, I mean, for humans, it seems natural. We have physical needs, all kinds of stuff. But when you think of artificial beings, it's not natural at all. Why should they have needs and drives? Well, they do have innate needs. Um, if we think of a quantum supercomputer, it has innate needs, but currently it's not a software system, and it's, its innate needs are handled by another computer that is making sure the environment is appropriate and that it has power and so forth. Those are its basic needs. I think when you when you work, we were talking earlier, right, about, about working in the virtual world versus the real world. So in the real world, uh, a robot has needs. Uh, or it, it stops dead in its track and it doesn't do anything. Um, your computer has needs. You know, so your virtual system, whether you... That's why it's it has, when it's nothing. It's <laughs> <almost nothing. laughs> you know, if your computer goes off, if all the computers uh, go off, you know, if, if, yeah, but, if a uh, comet but, comes uh, in and... Uh, these these needs are it. sort of... Uh, these needs are based on the fact that there are limited resources. And we have to somehow distribute these resources. This is the way we think... This is the way computers were designed. And... Little by little, we somehow move to to a certain state of the world where we have less restriction of resources. Well, hopefully, we do. And it seems this may change the whole paradigm. You don't really need to start from the from the, these needs or drives in order to get intelligence. But it seems that this is the, this is the assumption, basic assumption. So we're going to become like a maybe. Pardon? Like amoebas, we're going to become like amoebas, and our, our uh, environment will provide it just, all our needs. What do you think about that? Well, um, if if a comet uh, crashes into the Earth, then well, we can play it like that. That's a, I mean, that's a, a, an apocalyptic scenario. That I mean, it's of course. You know, we should have preventative measures and, 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 and things like that to prevent a comet from hitting us. I think a global brain would have no problem with comets. Like, I, I, do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like if, if you think if you think about where NASA is right now in terms of their you know near Earth object catalog and even some they but they even already have you know uh, candidate ways to deflect. A comet hitting the Earth, and obviously they haven't been tested out. But I'm just saying, I, I think the global brain, if we're talking about an advanced stage of AGI and the global brain merging or something like that, the 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 solving the problem of a asteroid coming would be easily handled. Okay, you know? well, you have a lot more um, faith in these systems than I do. I, I come out of a robot background, and we have physical systems, and you have to make them do things, and and they, they really don't behave the way you expect them to, or, or, or now maybe sometimes the per perfect intelligence, but even the perfect intelligence, they're going to be competing ideas on what is the goal, and I, and and reality is very very far from theory. Uh, because I... in theory, there's no difference between theory and reality, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm... I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I, I, maybe we're going to, to, to off topic, but I'm just trying to make the point that with, even without artificial general intelligence and a fully self-organizing global brain, like NASA has detailed, uh, you know, strategies for dealing with near-Earth objects, and I'm not sure, you know, obviously they haven't, 
you know, tested out any strategies for deflecting a comet, but there are reasonable mechanisms to, to prevent that type of, you know, cataclysmic event. I'm just saying that I think a global brain, you know, maybe that's me being naive, but I'm thinking a global brain civilization wouldn't have that as a, a global apocalyptic scenario, or it would be able to handle it. No, but it would still have the need to handle it. Well, yes, of course. It or yes. Not, there would still be a need to do something. Of, well. of course, I'm just saying. It, it, I'm just saying it wouldn't. It wouldn't be. To, point that, yeah. that, you need, that you need needs. Now sure, yeah. about needing needs, I think that the best argument is that evolution is a process that produces fitter and fitter systems. If you don't have needs, it means that you are fit the way you are. I might say that this. Chair does not have needs. It's fine the way it is. You can sit on it, you can put it on the table, you can do whatever you want with it. It's going to survive, probably. But that chair doesn't evolve. So if there would be some different kind of chair that would have needs, that needs in the sense that it tries to achieve things that it doesn't have yet, then that chair would have some kind of a competitive advantage because it could progress, it could advance while the other one couldn't. So systems that evolve, that advance, by definition they have needs because they have things in front of them that they don't have yet. And that allows them to advance. Not having needs means basically the way I am is perfect. There's something that can change what's purely something. Yeah, I, I agree with you, of course. I'm just at the, the um, I guess the, the overall larger point I'm trying to make is that I, I think that when we're in a global brain landscape, a lot of the a lot of the needs won't be survival based. You know, there'll be more desires, like opportunities to be explored. Like people will want to do things, yeah, and they'll be challenged. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I still think there will be. But you could say that uh, the NASA system to detect near Earth objects is the need to protect the boundary of planet Earth. Well, uh, a security. the, 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 a the Hubble planet. telescope to look at faraway galaxies and then the sun actualization because those faraway galaxies do not set on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just self actualized. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying it'll be more in terms of just pure creative desires, not necessarily. Like most of our attention won't be focused on basic survival. Yeah, but basic survival should not be dismissed. Now, you, you are risk to your survival, and if that risk is there, it will take over from all the other things. If you contact a boy, you will think first of all about your survival, and not be done about. Of course, yeah, of course. I, I, I'm just, I'm just sort of making, making the, making the assumption that in terms of like, you know, basic food, basic, you know, there won't be any major predator, you know, concerns. Won't be any major food needs or energy needs. Yeah, needs that is that, that's again the muscle yeah. pyramid. That as yeah. you develop, you move up in the hierarchy. You yeah, go more towards civilization, farther away from physiological and security. I'm imagining, that's what yeah. we hope our society will indeed yeah. uh, experience. Yeah, I'm just I'm essentially imagining a global self-actualized state. Uh, I'm most interested in uh, the connection between values and emotions. And you give some ideas, but it's still not quite clear to me what's the relationship between them. Because somatic markers, that's a vague term. It means something happens in your body, but lots of things happen in your body, and most of those things are not related to emotions. So how do you know which somatic markers are connected to values and which are not? Uh, yeah, there, there's some work been done on that. Um, that there are certain there are maps of certain brain states that are associated with anger or um, repulsions, as you know. Through the yes, yeah, that already assumes that you already know what the emotions are. So you already have an idea. Like I'm going to look for the markers of anger yes. and the markers of fear. Does that mean that you actually already start from an intuitive emotion? So it's not a definition of emotion independently from the intuition we already have. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. So well, you were saying that the mouse there was kind of defining emotions in terms of the somatic markers. And the conception that we have is secondary, and the somatic markers are primary. But who decides which 
somatic markers are markers of emotion. In the Mars because he already has the idea of what an emotion is, and he's looking for markers of that emotion. Oh, oh, um, they do that with the MRI scans. Uh, so they have MRI scans of people's brains uh, when they're feeling various emotions. And they know which parts of the brain are active. So, um, and, uh, oh, you have a base state, too. So you have a base state, so you're comparing the change from base state in heartbeat, in skin conductance. Um, you, of course, we don't have the sensing mechanisms at this point to, other than through MRI, to be looking at, so let's say your insula, which when you feel disgust or repulsion at an act, um, your insula becomes active. Um, so we don't have that marker on the image, it's right about that, we don't have that yet. Um, but that's a very, very clear, that's where the human feels disgust, we know that. Um, so if we are able to sense that. Um, let's say we're trying to, do, let's say that global brain is to try, trying to determine where a certain, whether a certain act is repugnant. Um, if we were able to link to people's insula, he would, they would be able to see whether the general audience, the crowdsourced feeling is repugnant. Mm -hmm. well, there are probably easier ways because the basic emotions you can recognize in facial expressions and even uh, disgust is, is one of those. So you can see an expression of disgust. So you wouldn't need to get access to the, to the instrument. But I again, can... you start from the idea that there are a number of basic emotions that we already know, because we have the intuition of them, but for a robot, it doesn't make sense that the robot needs to have these same emotions. But I would more interested in is the connection between drives or needs defined in this abstract way, the way you define self-preservation and so on, and then emotions as the intermediate between the actions that are actually performed, the needs as the abstract, okay. abstract I see, I goals, and the emotions as this kind of a mediating function. I understand what you're saying. So there is, it's a question I have been thinking about a long time, and I, I I have some preliminary theory, but I've never seen anybody really go to the good theory of emotions in that respect. There are some dimensions of emotions like positive, negative, or like uh, high arousal, low arousal. But if you really want to distinguish all the emotions we know in a simple scheme, everybody has different schemes and none of them fits nicely. So, uh, that's why I'm not sure we need to give them names uh, to, you know, that you have a certain range. The, I, I guess the reason I like the somatic markers is because they're measurable. Whereas um, the facial expressions, of course, can differ by culture. Well, there's no reason. No, 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 no. no. They, 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 are, they, are, they are universal. In so psychology, that's yeah. established there are universal emotions on the basis of, uh, of facial expressions. Mm -hmm. If you show Photos of people who are disgusted or fearful or angry to yeah. anybody from any culture, they will make the right, the right representation. But the problem is, we are not speaking about individual humans. We're speaking about sapiens prone, right. which is a new kind of entity. Yes. So we cannot just project the emotions that we know for individual humans to that kind of entity. So we need some kind of a more abstract notion of emotion. And just saying, yeah, well, we know the emotions of disgust and fear and so on, so we assume that Sapiens Prune will have those as well. Oh, so well, see, I'm not saying Sapiens Prune will have them. I'm saying we should make sure that Sapiens Prune is sensitive to human emotions as a self-protective measure for ourselves. Yeah, that, these are really two different problems. Ah, uh, you mean... The, yes. The, the artificial intelligence being able to recognize and connect with our emotions and the artificial intelligence having emotions. I think this is related. You have empathy. You cannot really recognize emotions without empathy. And yes, that's the same with humans. So you have to feel emotions in order to be, be able to recognize. I mean, the, 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 yeah, this, no these facial expressions, they are universal. 
I'm sure that they have already uh, they have recognition programs, uh, programs that can recognize. Uh, yeah, but that's 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 comes back to your question. You have to predefine emotions in order to to make these systems to recognize them. So you yeah. build this knowledge into they don't have them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so well, I, I was coming at this from uh, the, the classical um, robot that wants to increase its chess playing score and therefore kills the human being who's trying to do maintenance on it. Um, I, without that knowledge, so I'm saying that if we naive, uh, conclusions. If if we have a system that can sense when. Uh, humans are upset uh, on a large scale, um, then that's a better thing than not having a system. So, for instance, somebody was asking me about that little humanoid robot and what I thought of it, and the fact that it can, rec it can recognize your facial expressions and respond to you. Uh, I think its name is, there's one named Emo. Uh, and, uh, my concern is it's really like a psychopath because a psychopath recognizes facial expressions but doesn't feel them. And so basically you're, you're, you're building a psychopathic robot. So I... <laughs> <laughs> nice psychopaths. <laughs> They abuse their knowledge of your emotions to do nasty things with you and not mind. <laughs> Those are my no, I think that what we need is some kind of an emergent value system or utility function. I don't believe that utility functions can be pre-programmed. If you pre-program it, you will get something like this, just playing robots who will want to play chess, but I don't think it will want to kill people because that utility function is so specific. It it will not allow it to take serious influences outside of its domain of playing chess. That's why I believe that this kind of, like, th there was another example that they gave, like, the robot that wants to multiply the number of, of squares or circles or paper clips and will fill the whole universe with paper clips. <laughs> <laughs> These are nice thought experiments. That's, that's not going to happen. I mean, <laughs> An artificial intelligence that can only think about making as many paper clips as possible, or as winning as many chess games as possible, will simply be so clumsy that they will never be able to do anything than playing chess. It will not be able to get out of the room even. Well, okay. So, but theoretically, uh, of course, people are afraid that when you you uh, let a robot read whatever it wants about chess on the internet, it can read many things. And learn many things, and that you it perhaps is no longer if it is driven by a goal, but it is allowed to learn anything, but yet it remains driven by a single goal. Uh, it can learn many things that you thought it wouldn't know how to learn. Um, the question is, what does it learn? Does it learn objective knowledge, or does it learn values? Because. The, the intelligent way of learning is that you must not only uh, change your objective representation of the environment, that you also change your feelings, your emotions, your values. That you started out with one goal, then you see that a particular way of getting to that goal is very useful, so you start appreciating this particular way. And then you learn that another thing that you associated positively with the goal is actually not so effective, so you start uh, associating negatively. So your value system is shifting. It's shifting while you are learning. And the idea that there is one basic value that remains invariant, if you program your robot like that, I think it will never be able to learn very well. I think that's... That would be a really interesting experiment. That's not how It would be interesting to take a single value robot and to let it keep learning and see if that's true. That would be interesting. No, because let's take the example of the chess playing robot. Suppose that the robot starts killing people that want it to stop playing chess. Then the robot will learn in the second way that it will be punished or destroyed because it kills people. So in the second stage of learning, it should learn that it should not kill after people. It, after it kills someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's not going to happen. If you would 
follow the same kind of absurd reasoning. After a while, it would learn that killing people is not the right way to play chess. That actually it should be as friendly as possible to people because that's when that's how they will uh, help it to play as much chess as possible. Oh, okay. So, so it will develop a, 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 a sense of empathy and sympathy with everybody. You like and very uh, charming and, and particularly like, like <laughs> particularly poor chess players. It would be really good friends with poor chess. <laughs> I mean, this kind of argument, I mean, if you drive them to the limit, I mean, you always get to absurd results. I, I simply think, I think it's realistic that a robot whose only basic goal is to play as much chess as possible will ever learn to live in the world, be able to deal with the real world. I think to deal with the real world, you need to have a very, how would I say, very bold, mixed system of values that is bootstrapping in the sense that improvement in one value may be associated with decrease in another value and it will learn to change the priorities between the values and all the values will be constantly hovering above, about and some go up and some go down and some get connected and some get less connected and some get contradicted. That's the only way to learn to deal with the world, having a single value that's basic. I think it's going to work. Francis, it's you just said, well, not just a few like, 10 minutes ago, that you need hard coded needs in order for evolvability yeah, to happen. So, what's, how, that's how do you relate to what you say now? needs of the very high level, like the Maslow needs. So, like, meaning that still this so bottom level is needed for the. Uh, Self actualization, these are the basic ones. The in between ones, you might say these are social needs, a social species, like people need them, but you might say. And maybe a robot doesn't really need social participation or esteem. But at the least, a survival and the self actualization, that's kind of the, the, the two opposites. Like the minimum conservative, keeping what's there, self actualization, developing what's there. That you will need, but that's so abstract, so broad, you can't program that. Because oh. the robot doesn't know what does it mean to self actualize. You can't program the robot to self-actualize. You can give it a lot of heuristics and a lot of local values that, in effect, will lead to more self-actualizing I think you are, behavior. you are underestimating uh, robots. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think everybody is <laughs> overestimating formal models. It well, it's, like it's not necessarily formal models. Ultimate goal to let, let them do that, like self-actualize and like really manufacture this kind of robot. It does require the social needs, the social needs. Because you would not understand self actualization unless you understood esteem mm -hmm. and social uh, affinity. Because even if you turn toward yourself, you're comparing yourself with other models. And that social comparison doesn't happen. Isn't it hierarchical thinking about Maslow? Like, so, you know, is it in the, in this hierarchy of Maslow that you said it doesn't have to be a hierarchy? You have to have this level to have another one. That's, that's what uh, Levine is saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's saying that they're a competitive collaborative network and that they can inhibit each other and you can train one to be dominant over the other. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure that you can have no... It still seems to me that they are collaborative needs. I'm not sure that you can have... Um, self-actualization in particular without social understanding. Does it mean that orangutans can't self-actualize? What can you say? Orangutans. Orangutans. But they, they're extremely social. They hardly see each other. Orangutans aren't social at all. They are individual uh, uh, apes. They yeah. live on their own. The only solitary, moment, they're solitary. Yeah, they're solitary. The only moment they see others is when they are having sex or when they have a child. And it's usually the men that are just chasing down the female orangutan and they don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> they have, they have, the, the only they knowledge have. I have of orangutans is their ability to plan uh, escapes from zoos <laughs> <laughs> by hiding tools in their mouth. <laughs> So I think it's useful to have social abilities if you want to self actualize. I don't think it's strictly necessary. Well, Buddhists would say it's not necessary. Um, it's the difference, though, between 
your self-actualization philosophy. Because no, Buddha, 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 Buddha was just in the forest for a long time. But they still have people that still know it, so it's kind of social. Oh, well, there's a social component to yeah. it. <laughs> but they don't have to talk to each other, but they know they're Buddhists. Huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I mean, Buddha was an extremely social person. I mean, he was trying to help uh, humankind, you know. It's an extremely social person. After he self-actualized. As far as I know, he, he did that when he was 40, so before that he was pretty social. I'm not saying I'm not. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying I'm not saying that he, he he wasn't social, but like the whole reaching nirvana thing is about just being alone with your mind and watching your own mind and and sort of you know learning how to reach another stage <coughs> or, or dimensionality of your own consciousness. Okay, so I, I will grant that perhaps that's arguable. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's. I'm not. I'm not saying there's not a social component for self actualization. Now, another thing you said that I, uh, I'm not sure of is the uh, importance of self-awareness. Self-awareness, again, is useful, but do you need to have a self? Uh, there are systems like certain bonds or colonies uh, where there is not a clear boundary between self and environment, like all of fungus or certain colonial animals. Uh, we are so used of thinking in terms of individuals with a clear boundary and a clear self. But I think we tend to dismiss all these other cases, but in nature there are quite a lot of these cases where there is no clear boundary and still the system thrives and it develops and it grows and it evolves. So maybe sapiens could be more like that, I don't know. But it's not self -aware. And you're saying it doesn't need to be self-aware? Uh, no. Uh, again, self-actualization for me does not mean that you are self-aware. You are actualizing yourself, but you don't need to be aware that you're actualizing yourself. If actualizing yourself means basically growing, becoming better, becoming wiser, becoming smarter, becoming more knowledgeable. About how to sustain you can yourself do that. and your and, and your problem. Yeah, you can definitely do that without being self aware. Mm -hmm. um, it's again the social how far you can go into well, it's again the social uh, dimension. I mean it's useful to have the social contact because then you can look at another, see in what way that other is different or similar to yourself, and that way learn something about yourself that helps you progress. That's, yeah. that's, that's in humans, that's the typical way to, to advance. It, but there are creatures that apparently don't use that. Could they become as intelligent as humans? We don't know. We don't know examples because, of course, we are a unique species. Well, it seems to me that if, if we think of this entity which as as in a sort of fractal uh, uh, state that at different levels of the fractal it may be self-aware and at other levels it's not you know, it's, it's that are you the environment or are you the agent and at certain levels the agent may um, it, it seems at certain levels that every level of intelligence that is within the system will emerge. So it seems unlikely that at all levels of fractal with a whole lot of intelligence and entropy, we'll say, within it, at all levels is not going to be intelligent. Um, if, if we know how to create a human being, it seems unlikely that the system that evolves from us will not at some level know how to create a human being. Um, now whether... No, but we are like the cells of the sapiens boom, but we could be like the cells of a multicellular organism when there's a clear boundary, or we could be like the cells of a colonial organism when there's not a clear boundary. Okay, to me it seems most likely that whatever emerges from us will emerge at least to the level of Though we may go through a stage that we are an egg, if you will call it that, um, in which uh, 
it's not apparent that it will eventually be the human being. Um, well, at the moment, we're definitely at the stage where humanity is more like a colonial organism. In the sense. It's not clear whether everybody is integrated in it, and some people are more integrated and some are less integrated. So we're definitely in that colonial stage. I also tend to think that we are going to go to this multicellular stage where everybody will be integrated. It's not a necessity, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not a logical necessity that that would happen. So I'm also looking for more arguments to say why this would happen. The, the best argument I can see is that the ones that are kind of on the border, on the boundary, will be less well off than the ones that are inside. That's why the ones who are on the border will want to get inside. Just like now everybody wants to get into the internet. Those who don't have internet yet will soon have it because they will see that it's so advantageous to have internet that you would not want to be outside it. So that kind of reasoning, if I accept it, would say everybody will be part of Stephen's freedom. But yeah, it's not a new a logical necessity that an intelligent system necessarily has these boundaries and these self. I, I agree with you, but one could foresee a system in which um, the most advanced levels of intelligence do create teleporting yoke uh, of the system, and then perhaps uh, there are other parts of the show. I just use the big ones. Um, and that eventually then this organism could embed itself with, uh, you know, if, if, if we are in essence an egg rather than, I think we are the seed rather than uh, a colonial organism. So I'm saying there's that possibility. I have no evidence one way or the other, but it seems uh, it would be interesting. And I think the most likely evidence for that is when we go down the other nano direction and start to learn what, on a very very small scale, is happening at that level. Then we may get a better idea of where we're headed. One of the reasons why I'm making this argument is that I'm a little bit playing with devil's advocates. It's the kind of argument that most people make if they hear the idea of the global bank or the global superorganism. Like, yeah, but okay, we are part of society, but society is not really like an organism. It does not have a soul, it does not have a, a boundary. So we need better arguments to answer those people. And we have some arguments, but we think that's. Yeah, that was what I was completely compelling one idea. What I was getting into when I mentioned reproduction systems, because most description of creatures, of entities, uh, in, the, in the definition, there's something about reproduction. But there, I don't think we will find one. Because I don't think it makes sense for a global brain to reproduce. At most, you might spawn off uh, the colonization of other planets, but if there would be plants within the social system, within the solar system, we will keep contact with them, which means that they will not really be independent. If they would be outside of the social system, uh, outside of the solar system, it will be take a very long time before we are able to colonize plants outside of the solar system. If we're talking about scales that you know, for us to even speak about, we really have no sense of because these are scales that are vast. So if we are part of some vast multi or single cell organism, we would never know if that organism was part of another vast, <laughs> even yet vaster system or being. We would never know. And likewise, however, if we're part of an egg, we will never know what's going to happen to that egg because the scales are just so very different. Um, as I say, though, if, if we go downward and start to find <coughs> some sort of um, where we can start to link directions of what we are and what we are going down. Um, I, I tend to agree with you, and in, in, in that case it sort of makes the argument that in many, by many definitions, the global brain is not what people would consider an entity, even though it might be 
Well, so what would you call it, though, if you have a higher level of organization? But, but yes, it the, doesn't reproduce. Well, it doesn't need to. I mean, uh, another example is a society or an ecosystem. Ecosystems yeah. don't eat, don't reproduce. Yeah. Then they the same, survive. They then don't. it would not be a really the kind of entity that a lot of it says so singularity is, is talking about. You know, it's not uh, an entity in its own that's, that's going to act. Either that or the definition of needing to reproduce is wrong. Yeah, but maybe this definition is just in the it's just so modeled on biological entities and there are others, yeah. other entities as well. You know, so maybe just you know, changing the definition is something that they <laughs> So they know may or may not represent. <laughs> but I sort of think it will want to. I mean, the reason that entities reproduce is for security and safety. Mm -hmm. But if you have a system that's big enough and diverse and we don't want enough, that's enough safety. I mean, yeah. Even if, if, if a comet would strike the earth and half of the people would die, the superorganism wouldn't die, it would reconstitute itself. When you, when you have a system that takes all the space there is and has no like life lifespan that's closing to its end, so it has no, no boundaries. No way to reproduce. Yeah, well, but then <laughs> that system has no you know, entropy and you're, you're, it has no life. I mean, it, you're left with it. System, which isn't a system anymore. No, that, 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 no that's not possible. No, it's it's not system. A system. It has to have entropy. Yeah, yeah you said the human uh, drives of powerful people will determine sapiens guru who didn't function initially. It's not really a, a bottom up uh, for Shadu. Oh, okay. Well, in that, I'm talking about the AGI portion. Yeah, I should have been either, uh, better. Find that. I'm talking about the AGI portion of sapiens mm -hmm. So, our, our, uh, yeah, the artificial general intelligence. I sh that should say artificial general intelligence. Um, you know, who's in control of that? I mean, we know the universities that are involved in the European efforts. Uh, we know that IBM is doing it. We know that Google's doing it. Uh, no doubt the US government's doing it. Um, military. Uh, you know, China's doing it, certainly, uh, Japan. Yeah. So, which depends with the EU, I think. Um, and at the beginning, you, you said we need a, a bottom up uh, way to, to to embed some ethics in and the AI and so on. And that's what how, I was. How do you yeah. imagine this? Well, so I was suggesting. So, you know, there are two, two aspects here. One is how does uh, a global brain have uh, emotions and controls and make ethical decisions? <coughs> My view from Sapiens Plurum is more how do we make sure that those ethical decisions um, support what would generally be perceived as humane? How do we say, make sure that China or Somalia or ISIS or whoever does not, um, how can we try to create systems that protect people? So that's what I was trying to get at. And I think that part of that is being connected in a very functional, um, physical way to humans. And, a, in a way that when you turn off the lights, it doesn't stop working. Um, you know, I think or when somebody's asleep, uh, that there there needs to be a way. If we are an integral being, and if we have this limbic system that is quite good at taking state and turning them into actions, then is there a way to incorporate that? in the global brain, in a way that would protect human beings. So that was what I was trying to say. Well, one of the things I like in your presentation is that you say that there is this default behavior that you only make a decision at the moment, you have to make a decision, it means if the de deviation between what you think should be the case and what you perceive to be the case becomes big enough. 
And that's indeed how we function, otherwise it would be too complex. And for that you need a system that can measure these deviations quickly, and that's what the limit system does. And we know it does that by giving signals that lead to emotions. But there was a problem I had in the beginning. We know some of the typical human emotions like anger and disgust. But are these necessarily the same kind of signals that the global brain system should have? Oh, some anger. other kind of signal, some other kind of signal that shows a deviation that's important in a way. Yeah. The somatic marker is not anger and disgust. That's it. It's what Damasio says. The somatic marker is my heart beats racing. My heart is racing. My heartbeat is far above normal. That's the somatic marker. Yeah, yeah, I know, but the, the interpretation in terms of emotions is still, that is a marker for anger. It's not just a marker for well, some kind marker, of a feeling. It's a marker for fear. It's a marker for a lot of things. Um, but if the heartbeat is way above normal, then say it's poor and she goes, something's wrong here. Yeah, so we need markers for something that is deviating too much from what we want. So basically that's what we need, we need some kind of an, an error signal. So, so, okay, so what's your, um, you, you're protesting against the names, joy and anger and, and so forth, that are sort of not necessarily, not necessarily. I'm just saying that maybe yeah, that we, we might need to formulate it more it's aspects. Distracting. Yeah. I can see how that it, it is distracting because there's there may be more let's say there may be more dimensions than those seven or eight uh, basic emotions. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So if we go I, I think that's a good idea to just focus on the somatic markers, the actual part of the skin developments without giving them names. Because the names bring up all kinds of emotions. Yeah, uh, yeah but you're speaking as far as I'm sort of somatic markers of individual people, but maybe you also need markers of, let's say, problems that are visible at the level of technology or society or economics. Like now there are uh, signals like uh, inflation and uh, GNP growth mm. that are also in a sense kind of markers for the health of society. And maybe social markers too, mm -hmm. the fruits of the way oh, a lot of those people are running away. They're all, people are running away. There must be something wrong. <laughs> and that would probably be an indicator. But I still think that we uh, like, uh, we have in our language or like uh, those emotions names, the, the ones that are most uh, important in social relations. They have names and also. We have names for situations that are unrecognizably important in social life, in social economic systems. So maybe I'm not sure if getting rid of those labels is necessary because you know they they are there for for reasons. So just finding uh, yeah, maybe not getting rid of them, but uh, being open to have more than the ones that yeah, so for which we have labels. Just a range of abstract emotions of the global brain may be wider than the emotions that we typically think of. So being open in search of such configurations of like emotion on a, on a somatic level and for example markers, eco economical markers and social markers, yeah. that okay, it, it fires together, so something else is this is this something is happening and we're occurring. So. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's a little bit like what the Kelvin called the planetary nervous system, mm -hmm. where you also have a system of sensors that measure all these kind of variables and that tell you whenever you are kind of deviating from what it should be. The Kelvin is uh, one of our uh, advisory boards. K E L B I N G. H E L B I N G. Kelvin. Kelvin. It's very well known. Yes. Uh, but I would like to continue with this idea of the default and the, and the deviation. So as you said, if you tell the robot to go in one direction and it just goes until he meets some kind of an obstacle, it will work much better than if you let him at each moment decide about the optimal next step. 
So that is indeed also, I think, a good approach if you want to steer a global society. You should kind of define a general direction and then just monitor whether there is too much deviation from the general direction instead of at each moment trying to make it open. And then the emotions of the global brain could be the something of these deviations where deviations can be in different directions and therefore there would be the equivalent of different emotions to recognize. Like a, a, a simple example is the difference between positive and negative uh, emotions. If you're moving in a certain direction, you go faster than you expected, you would feel a positive emotion. If you go more slowly than you expect, you would feel a negative emotion. And there's your value. Yeah. But who is the decider in, in this global brain case? The one that decides what's, what's the direction. Well, there's no boundary. Well, yeah, so that's why I outside. like the idea of the vehicles <coughs> that there would be some kind of an emergent default in the sense of the direction that most people kind of find a good direction. I think everybody agrees that there should be less poverty and less disease and less discrimination and less war and more education and more this and that. And if you could somehow measure these implicit values of most people, you would find a kind of a default. And then the moment you notice that in a particular place there is more pollution than you expect or more conflict than you expect, like in, with ISIS for example, that there would be a strong signal like we should intervene here, something is going on here. So it, it's not obvious, but I have always thought that the idea of defining a utility function in the sense of programming it doesn't work. It needs to be emerging. But it needs to be emerging for what? I think for all the implicit utility functions that all the people in the world have. You should somehow be able to measure what everybody ex implicitly considers goods. And I think on most things people agree. Yeah, but that's, that's, uh, that's the thing, that in order to develop the measure, you need to have something outside the system. Measure. You just cannot do it. If you say that there's nothing outside the system which can define you know, the girl. No, no, you, you, you let it emerge, that means you collect lots of little data points within the system and you create some kind of aggregation of those that defines the general direction. So if you look at yes. um, Gersel's latest paper, it, he talks about this coherent extrapolated, uh, well, Yudkowsky talks about coherent extrapolated volition and, and Gersel calls it a coherent blended volition. Um, but but they didn't write this it's together a, as a, it's uh, Gertzel no, kind Yankowski of... No, wrote quite a while ago and then Gertzel responded to something like that. Responded yeah, and incorporated that. Yeah, I found yeah, it. It's, uh, it's, it's in... Uh, Coherent extrapolated volition. Let's see. Yeah, that's this one. <coughs> Nine ways to bias open source age yeah. towards twenty twelve. Oh, yeah. I'm also interested in the book of Philip Rocha, The Origin of Self Consciousness. Yeah, it's very interesting. He he's uh, gone around the world and met with people who have never looked in the mirror before, uh, mm -hmm. and then showed them the mirror, and then, and then video them as they respond. But um, uh, Frost Wall, uh, who works with primates, and uh, one of his PhD students did work at the New York Zoo with elephants, and put up this very strong industrial strength mirror in the elephant uh, area, and then videoed the elephant's response to seeing themselves. And they showed signs of self-awareness. Um, for instance, uh, the, the elephants would kind of walk by and, <laughs> and touch, you know, wrap the trunk around the mirror to feel it. But then one of the oldest elephants then stood in front of the mirror, picked up a piece of hay, and started picking her teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I was 
so we saw recently a movie by NASA fundraising movie that it claimed that global thinking really started when the people could see uh, satellite pictures of the globe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once once we could see it, it started to support awareness of the planet. So. Yeah, Joel Burnell also make that point in uh, one of his older books on uh, what was it called? Where he also describes the world system that he said that people became aware that there's something like a global system where they could see the globe as. So that as actually, when you see it, you start to you know. Get if, if you, especially if you see it from the moon, you're far enough that you can see it as this little ball far away that it's in the system. And, and what uh, some astronauts have written about is just how fragile they look. That's what the, the sense of, oh my god, we're the only one like this. <laughs> oh, stop. At least I know we can see it. Uh, I see you have a, a reference of Done. Is he still active? Because I know he wrote some big books in the 1970s. Done. Psi? Psi guy? Yeah. It's a German guy who did some pretty famous uh, simulations of uh, complex problem solving where he confronted people with how to run a spin and that saw how the reactive they were put in the ring in complexity. Yeah, so this was 2010. Maybe his you know, student did a lot of work. Oh yeah, blended version, and uh, let's see, Minkowski called it something else. Yeah, um, yeah current extrapolated volition is what Minkowski called it, and then Goetzel called it blended volition. But how do they uh, Well, as I say, they, they're, they want to survey people. One of the problems with survey is that people often form their opinion the moment they are asked because the way you ask it. Yeah, if exactly. you ask it in a different way, they might have a different opinion. Yeah, exactly. That's I think much better uh, visualizing. I mean, what, what I would see is that we would visualize options. And, um, I mean, many of the people, Goetzel and, and Alejandro, um, both talk about training the ADL. To train it, we would um, visualize options and then have people. The way I would suggest we do it is have people um, wired or possibly MRI or whatever sensing technologies we come up with, and that we can see <coughs> we can see their response, not ask them their response, but see their response. And you would use that as a um, signal to train. Uh, yeah. With wasn't there a clockwork orange at the end of the day showing them horrible movies? But, um, but that was to teach him. I mean, we teach him like we, the talk the clockwork orange. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad idea. I still don't think it would work. I mean, I mean I'm pretty skeptical about the possibilities of having an AGI as smart as a human in any near future. After the global brain will be there, he has done it, may be possible, but not before. So um, I think that's simply underestimating the complexity of uh, human. I, th I think that we have no way to, what is as smart as a human being? I mean, we, we would need to come up with tests, and I'm not sure 
what kind of tests we have because it seems to me that the problem is that any test tests one particular capability. Yeah. And for any particular capability, sooner or later you can write a program that does that perfectly, like just for example. But that does not mean that it can do something else, it just is very wide range adaptability of humans that's very difficult to test. And that's just the API, that's why AI is very successful if it's not general intelligence. In specific intelligence, AI is very, is very useful. But in general intelligence, that's the tricky. What's general intelligence? You should be able to do anything. And that's but that's why I think it will have a human element is to provide that capability. Precisely, precisely. I mean, it seems to me, what is breathtaking to me is the rapidity with which the direct brain interfaces. I mean, I don't know if you noticed at the very beginning, but the, uh, you had. Well, I haven't followed that recently, so if you have some they have, uh, things about it, I'm interested. Well, there's a uh, open source interface for direct brain. It's, uh, what, what kind of sense is it? What uh, it right sense? now, it's, it's the cap. Ah, it's so it's, 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 it's on the basis of EEG. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But right here, oh, it's called, I think it's called OpenMind. It's open BMI. Open. BMI. It's uh, open hardware, open source, whatever. It's it open. still not very clear to me in how far you can control your <coughs> You can control them to some degree, but can you control them sufficiently to really communicate more than a few yes, bits they, of they, they have, so they have nice. experiments. I'm thinking lower. They did a few years ago. Where they put a cap and uh, a person was able to write very slowly, write on the computer to pick letters. And yeah, now they are developing. That's again a very slow way of. Yes, but you know, it's choosing one out of 26 letters, and okay. that's every few seconds. Okay, but so people have to okay. learn write, and they start it slowly, and then mm -hmm. they become faster. So. The second one in the University of Washington, what's going on here is that um, one person is viewing a video game. And the other person is playing it. Is is moving the, oh, moving this the other person's or hand. Oh, that's the two-dimensional. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm sure you can steer things with a few degrees of freedom, but. But it will be very difficult to do better than what your eyes and your hands already do, which have many more degrees of freedom. Yes, so but the idea that you, it's one person can control another person's hand, that's. <laughs> we're in well, way I mean, it, 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 it looks spectacular, but the, the usefulness is not obvious. I mean, for people who are uh, paralyzed, it's of course extremely useful. But for people who could use their voice and their hands to communicate, okay, it's uh, probably a not, surgeon. Not, not. A surgeon. Okay, I have a surgeon over here who knows how to do one kind of surgery, and uh, I, I'm here. Use my hands. Do the surgery. Yeah, but he will. It would be probably much, much better if you actually follow the positions of his finger and if you follow his brainwaves. I think you would get much more precise. Uh, oh, sure, I'm sure there will be better ways to do it, but I, I'm saying is that um, there are applications now that are just astounding, um, and, you know, this is... So the trouble is that there are much more probably now um, ideas how to use it in military. Yes. When you can control somebody's weapons. Just imagine putting your you know, enemy that you can use their hands. They could just kill each other. Or no, 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 no. That kind of control they don't have. No, I think that if you, if you um, someone gets into a piece of equipment or a plane and they don't know how to fly it or drive it, um, so the sad thing about it is that you can use someone who needs money very badly and put them into a device and someone else can use them to drive it or to do evil things. 
So you yeah. can manipulate. Yeah, yeah that's possible. But uh, again, I don't think it's a question of brain to brain interface. You just need to have to have interface, which will be much more precise than a brain to brain interface. So, oh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in brain to brain interfaces, but what I suspect is that people tend to underestimate the bandwidth problem. It's much more difficult to see what's going on in the fine ranges of your brain than it is to see what's going on in the fine ranges of your fingers or your voice. You can't put, you can't put sensors in every single neuron in your brain. You only have this of signals like EEG. That's not that's so maybe with that. Oh, oh, okay. No, um, I have definitely seen images that are taken from your, I believe it's V2, your uh, visual system V2, the one that's like a screen. And I've seen those images taken from a person's brain and sent to another person. Um, that, okay. No, you definitely can do that. So you can project the images from V2 on one person's brain and send it to a computer and print it out. What kind of this is this was done two or three years ago. I, I could send you the image. That's all I remember. Yeah, this is not new. But I suspect the resolution would not be okay. It's obvious how to increase the resolution without really putting things inside you, the brain. The things were recognizable because they showed a photograph and then the image yeah. from the brain. Uh, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure that if you show uh, a photograph of which is either a big letter F or a big letter O, that you would see the O shape or the F shape. Kind of projected, I'll send would you, you be able to recognize? I sort of think it was University of Washington, which is the same ones that did this. This is University of Washington. But I'll, I'll send you the link on that. Yeah, that's what these, the advances of brain to brain interface um, are just flabbergasting to me. And they most prove that we are. Speak to each other without speaking to each other. That's, that's quite. Anyway, I, I thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to talk with you and to get your feedback. And so, if you think of anything later, please write me. Uh, it's, it's really been uh, an honor to uh, come and have the opportunity to hear your thoughts. Uh, lots of good feedback. Including economic signals and human signals, and thinking about that provides feedback. Now, what do you think of the names? Do you like sapiens? Mm -hmm. Just means humans. Human. Uh, sapiens plural like means. Why is humans together? Sapiens plural means the wisdom of many. Wisdom. So, so if you think of technology, because it's not just home anymore. But the sapien is still there, we know. <laughs> so it's, it's just a, a way of expressing uh, collective intelligence or collective wisdom. Yeah, and it can include our technology, because I mean, the technology is our offspring, right? I mean, we need it. So, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I just thought global brain has this sort of cold kind of feel to it that I think is off-putting to many people. And um, I thought if we bring it to a human level, because what I'm trying to do is communicate popularly, you know, with my Facebook page. My, I have a Sapiens Forum Facebook page. And I'm trying to build the audience for that among the general public and to speak to the issues there in a way that the general public can relate to. And so I thought, you know, Sapiens Forum is something it's a little warmer and fuzzier than Well, but it also sounds kind of technical, kind of Latin. Oh, it is Latin. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know what's, what's... In English, lots of people use homo sapiens, and that's... But you're right, it's fine. It's interesting in your title that you would like it to be more humane, but you drop the homo. <laughs> okay, well, well, people are not necessarily humane as we only need.
to watch the news for five seconds. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I doubt that because I mean it's it's yeah, not it's, uh, it's not just biological. So maybe it's not a good idea to get these semantic markers from people if they are not necessarily humane. You can get all the stuff that you see in the news. We can, we can. Well, I'm, I'm presuming that stochastically we'll be able to uh, filter out the. <laughs> I, I mean, most, as long as. Well, but the people who would cheer when ISIS cuts off somebody's head yeah. would be a very small minority compared to all those that will be discussed. <laughs> Exactly. I'm not sure I'm talking about these extreme cases in general. Uh, then you say, okay, then we will we will read all the semantic markers and we'll filter something out, which means you have a, you have to make a decision. So these are good, these are bad. Yeah. Somebody has to make it. Yeah. yeah, those decisions have to be made, but they can be made probabilistically. Um, they don't, you know, have to. They don't have to be made on the case. But the important thing about the the um, crowdsourcing. That they found though is that you can't cue it. If if you um, have an authority speak before everyone votes, your your uh, reliability is gone. So it, they have to be independent decisions by the crowd. Um, so you can't what's called in psychology cue the answer at all, or else it will it will be distorted and it will. So if you were have to some some um, celebrity figure give their opinion of what should happen, then everyone would you know all the opinions would be distorted to reflect that opinion. It would be much less representative of an accurate situation. And there is, what's amazing to me, and you looked at any of this crowdsourcing, they could put you could put a jar of marbles in the, in the room. And if you have enough people go by and guess how many marbles are in there, it will be within two or three. It's just, it doesn't, it does it not, is, not always work. I did the experiment myself. Did you? Well, yeah. not with a marble. It was, it was a different kind of question. It was at the, the school of my daughter. They had a photo of all the teachers of the school. And you were supposed to guess the total age of all the teachers had it. And afterwards I asked them to give me the answer that people had said. Then I calculated the average. The average was not enough. <laughs> not, enough, not enough people. Well, no, maybe. there were quite a lot of people. There were quite a lot of people. Maybe there was clearly a bias. People were. Two. No, 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 it were adults. And my, own, and my own guess was also very young. So. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if you They were younger than you thought. So. This is called stupidity of the crowd. It's another thing. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting. But, what was that? There was some sunken ship or downed plane or something that they were looking for for years and years and years. And finally, um, one fellow had experts from all over the world. Um, give their guesses of where this was. And then he took the average, uh, the center point, for all those guesses. And they actually found it after three to five years um, by, it was within something like 200 miles, uh, 100 miles of that center point in the Pacific. Well, it works if people are unbiased. I mean, that there are different errors uh, compensate for each other, but if for whatever reason the data seem to point in one direction, which is not the right one, and everybody will make yeah. the same error. Well, Apparently so if that you... was the case with these teachers, I don't know for which reason, maybe they looked over the photo than they were, or people used the wrong heuristic. My heuristic was, I'll assume that there will be as many teachers near the end of their career as what at the beginning of their career, so to the average age oh, of the in normal. the middle. You thought it was a normal distribution. Yeah. yeah. Uh. But if, if you think of it entropy-wise, if you had a situation like which um, you need lots of different points of view to gain all the information, all the entropy. Right? If everybody's got a little bit of entropy and you put it all together, 
then you should get a good decision. If you're in a situation where actually experts have much, 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 much more information than the general public, then you would want to hold the experts, right? Because you have more information. Well, you can simply give the, the experts a higher weight. It, it's yeah. not because the experts agree on something that the experts are right. There are no examples where the experts are biased in the same way. Just because yes. they are experts, they tend to rely on the same kind of sources. Right. Well, the general public doesn't have such good sources, so they're more scattered in the sources they rely on. But it depends on where the entropy is, right? How well you're going to do with the class or something. I think there is no simple general rule. In yes. some cases it works very well, in other cases it doesn't. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, talk on this at that meeting that I mentioned to you, American Association of Artificial Intelligence. There's going to be a workshop on crowdsourcing. <laughs>